Well, I was going to tell you a funny story this morning, and I got busy in another room, and I forgot to look one up. But I do have stories to share. It may not be funny, but it is a good story. <coughs> there was a, a small gathering of people, but primarily, primarily adults, and there was one little girl, just a little one. She had a, a sipper cup and a straw. And she was walking around, and she was trying to put that straw in the top of this cup. Well, it's a sipper cup. It wasn't going in, but she was trying so hard. So she went up to one of the adults and got their attention. And it was like, can't get it in. And they're like, yeah, yeah honey, yeah, honey. Just kind of pushed her aside, because adults have a tendency to do that when they're talking and little ones come underfoot. But she was tempted to get that stronger. So she's working with that strong. She's trying to get it in the cup. And she walks up to another adult. And she's, she's working with it. And this person just kind of takes her by the shoulders and pushes her aside. And they go on with their conversation. The little girl working so hard with the straw to get it in the sipper cup. She walks up beside her daddy. And she's looking at him. And she's. I'm going to imagine those brown eyes because that's what my little girl's got, is brown eyes. She's looking up to him with those great big old puppy dog eyes and she's trying to push that straw in there. And Daddy reaches down in his pocket, pulls out his pocket knife, opens it, takes a cup from her hand, cuts the top off, takes the straw, slips it in, and hands it back to her. Gives her a smile, puts the pocket knife back in his pocket, goes on with the conversation. That's what our God does to us. We walk around, we go to everybody else, and we ask for help. They love us, but they don't necessarily help us. They let us know they're there, because they, yes, honey, uh-huh, yeah. They let us know we're there. But when we go to God, God says, I'll fix that for you. He reaches in, gets his pocket knife, cuts away the problem. That's our God. That's the God of our heart. I know it wasn't a funny story, but I think it's just cute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In fact, that's a, a story you get from Sunday school classes. Because I was teaching a Sunday school class probably, hmm, I'm going to say four or five years ago, when I read that story in a David C. Cook Sunday school lesson book. It was in that book, and I remembered that story. So those. Stories do make impressions sometimes on your heart. But also, as puppeteering at the time, I thought, oh, that's a good one for puppets. <laughs> <laughs> I know you guys were cold when you came in, and I promised you a fire in brimstone sermon so that you would warm up. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is the second Sunday after Epiphany. We're going to look at servants' messages. Mission. I don't know if it's going to have much farm brimstone to it, but maybe it'll make you feel warm <coughs> to know that God loves us so much. The, the scripture I'm looking at is from Isaiah chapter 49, verses 1 through 7, and I will be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. And it's Isaiah chapter 49, verses 1 through 7, beginning with verse 1. Listen to me. O coastlands, pay attention, you peoples from far away. The Lord called me before I was born, while I was in my mother's womb, and he named me. He made my mouth like a sharp sword in the shadow of his hand, and hid me. And he made me a polished arrow in, arrow in his quiver. He hid me away. And his hand, he said to me, You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain, I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity, yet surely my cause is with the Lord and my reward with God. And now the Lord says, who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him, for I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, it is to light a thing that you should be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. 
Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, his Holy One, to one deeply despised and whored by the nations, the slave of rulers. Kings shall see and stand up princesses, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord, who is faithful, the Holy <coughs> One of Israel, who has chosen you. May God bless the reading of his holy word. Thanks be to God. Before the servant, the Messiah, was born, God had chosen him to bring light to the gospel. The message of salvation to the world. When we look at the book of Acts, chapter 13, verse 47, it says, God had planned for Israel to be this light. Through Israel came Jesus, the light of the nations. The light would spread out and enlighten the Gentiles. Then when we look in the book of Luke, chapter 2, verse 32, it tells us, The Jews were well acquainted with the Old Testament prophecies that spoke of the Messiah's blessings to their nation. They did not always give equal attention to the prophecy saying he would bring a salvation to the entire world, but just the Jews. Many thought he'd come to save only his own people. In the book of Luke, Luke made it very clear to his Greek audience to understand that Jesus came for all believers, Gentiles, as well as Jews. Jesus Christ offered salvation to all nations. Jesus' apostles began the missionary movement to take this gospel to the ends of the earth. In the book of Matthew, when we look at chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, it tells us, God gave Jesus authority over heaven and earth. On the basis of that authority, Jesus told his disciples to make more disciples as they preached and baptized and taught. With the same authority, Jesus still commands us to tell the gospel and make them disciples for the kingdom. When someone is dying or leaving us, his or her last words are very important. Jesus left the disciples with these last words of instruction. They were under his authority. They were to make more disciples. They were to baptize and teach each new disciple to obey him. Jesus told them that he would be with them always. That's my puppet, Dodger's favorite verse is, I am with you, I am with you always, is what he says. I can't even say it without him on my hand. My hand squeaks. <laughs> but Jesus says, I am with you always. In precious visions, Jesus had sent his disciples only to the Jews. The disciples' mission from now on would be worldwide. <coughs> Jesus is Lord of the earth. Jesus died for the sins of the people from all nations. We are to go, whether it's next door or to another country, and make disciples. It's not an option. It is a command to all who call Jesus Christ Lord. We're not all evangelists. But we have all received gifts that we can use in helping to fulfill the Great Commission. As we are obeying Jesus' command, we have comfort in the knowledge that Jesus is always with us. In the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verse 19, Jesus says, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Jesus' words affirm the reality of the Trinity. There are some people that accuse theologians of making up the concept of the Trinity and reading it into the scriptures. But Matthew verse 19 says the concept comes directly from Jesus Christ himself. Jesus did not say, baptize in the names. Jesus said, baptize them in the name of the Father, 
the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The word Trinity does not occur in Scripture, but it well deserves the three-in-one nature of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The disciples were, baptized, were to baptize the people, and, and because of baptism, it united a believer with Jesus Christ in his death to sin and resurrection of a new life. Baptism shows a submission to Christ. Willingness to live God's way. An identification with God's covenant people. How is Jesus Christ with us? Jesus Christ was with the disciples physically until he ascended into heaven and then spiritually through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would be Jesus' presence that would never leave his believers. Jesus continues to be with those who follow him today through the Spirit. In the book of Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 5, it tells us, the Trinity is a description of the unique relationship of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If Jesus had stayed on earth, his physical presence would have limited the spread of the gospel. Because physically, Jesus couldn't be in more, more than one place at a time. But after Jesus' ascension, he would be spiritually present everywhere through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was sent so that God would be with and within his followers after Jesus returned to heaven. Amen. Jesus' spirit would comfort his followers. He would guide his followers to know the truth. Jesus' spirit would remind his followers of his words. Jesus' spirit would give his followers the right words to say and fill them with power. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was made available to all who believed in Jesus. Believers receive the Holy Spirit are baptized by him. When we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, the Old Testament prophecies and genealogies in the book of Matthew present Jesus' credentials for being king of the world. Jesus is not a military or a political leader, as the disciples had originally thought he would be, or they even hoped he would be. Jesus is a spiritual king who can overcome all evil and reign in the heart of every person. If we, re if we refuse to serve Jesus Christ faithfully, we are disloyal as subject to his kingship. If we are disloyal, we are fit only to be banished from the kingdom. As followers in Jesus Christ, we must make Jesus king of our lives and worship him as our savior, king and lord. Missionary work today continues. Jesus' great commission. Taking the light of the gospel to all nations. Right here. Right here at Fletcher Chapel, we not only help the missionary work through the United, United Methodist Church, we help our missionaries that, that work through our church, but right here from this church, we have a mission to reach out to our local community. That's our mission. Looking in the New Testament at the first book of Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, Paul has written this letter to the church in Corinth while he was visiting Ephesus during his third missionary journey. Corinth and Ephesus faced each other across the Aegean Sea, and Paul knew the Corinthian church well because he'd spent like 18 months there in Corinth during his second missionary journey. While in Ephesus, Paul heard about problems in Corinth. About that same time, a de delegation from the Corinthian church visited Paul to ask the advice about the conflict. 
Paul's purpose in writing a letter to the church of Corinth was to correct these problems and to answer questions the church members had asked in a previous letter. The scripture tells us that Paul was specifically called by God to preach about Jesus Christ. Every Christian has a job to do. We as followers of Jesus Christ have a role to take in life. Or we have a contribution to make to God's kingship or his kingdom. One assignment may seem more spectacular than another. All assignments are necessary to carry out God's greater plans for the world. You might be thinking to yourself, I'm not aware of any assignment or assignments that I'm supposed to be doing. Well, just let me help you out. <laughs> we are supposed to be available to God by placing our gifts at his service. What I mean by gifts is your talents. Whatever you can do for God's kingdom, no matter what kind of gift or talent you have, God can use it. He can use you. God may only ask you to pray. God may ask you to bake a cake. He may ask you to be just a helping hand. The list goes on and on what God might give you direction to do. God's list is boundless. It really is. There is no, absolutely no limits to how God may use you. I read in a commentary, and I probably shared it with you guys before, but the, the lady went to the pastor and she said she just felt worthless in the church because she, she just didn't give to the church. She did nothing. And she said the only thing she usually does is bake a cake when they have a dinner or something. That's it. That's all she's able to do. That's all she knows to do. Pastor told her, he said, that's your talent. Not everybody can bake a cake. Not everybody can do that. I'm one of those that can bake a cake, but it kind of goes, oh, it's a little wonky. <laughs> That's not my gift. God gave me different gifts. Each one of you have a gift. And God's going to use that gift in a different way. If you say, I'm not physically able to do something, well, you may not be, but you can pray. Amen. That doesn't take a lot to pray. You don't even have to open your mouth Amen. to pray. <laughs> God hears your thoughts. He knows your heart. God's just boundless. list is just absolutely boundless. No limits. God will only have you doing things for his kingdom that he knows you can do. He'll not give us anything we can't handle. There's going to be things he asks us to do that is going to probably I don't want to say give us fear, but it really concern us about doing it. But we'll do it. We may be shaken like a leaf when we do it, but we'll do it. Could God instruct us to do it? We are to be available to God by placing our gifts and our talents at his service. You will discover that he's calling you to do. You'll know what he's calling you to do. You'll feel it. You'll know he's asking you to do something. Amen. Be ready. Be ready to just do it. And looking at the scripture, Sosthenes may have been Paul's secretary who wrote this letter to the Corinth church as, Paul's, as Paul dictated it. Sosthenes was a Jewish synagogue leader in Corinth who was beaten during the attack on Paul. Later after the attack, Sosthenes became a believer Sosthenes was well known to the members of the Corinthian church. So Paul included Sosthenes' family name in the opening of that letter. Corinth was a giant cultural melting pot with great diversions of wealth, religion, intellect, and moral standards. Corinth had a reputation for being fiercely independent. They had a reputation for having a life of excessive money and no sense of responsibility like a lot of large cities have. The Romans destroyed Corinth in 
146 BC, after a rebellion. In 46 BC, the Roman emperor, Julius Caesar, rebuilt it because of its strategic seaport. In Paul's day, the Romans had made Corinth the capital, which is the present day Greece. Corinth was a large city. It offered Rome great profits through trade as well as the military that protected its ports. But the city had an excess of money and its fingertips made it ripe for all sorts of corruption. Idolatry for, for, uh, flourished. Ooh, can I get that word out? But idolatry flourished. <laughs> there were more than a dozen pagan temples. I forget how many thousands of harlots poor, poor and prostitutes they said these temples had in them, these pagan temples. They're, they were way off the grid on what they were worshiping. It was wrong. When we are given a personal invitation, it makes us feel wanted and welcomed. God personally invites us to be citizens of his eternal kingdom. We are called to be saints. Jesus, God's son, is the only one who can bring us into this glorious kingdom. Jesus Christ is the only one who removes our sins. Sanctified by Christ means we are chosen or set apart by Christ for his service. We accept God's invitation by accepting the Son, Jesus Christ, and trusting in the work he did on the cross to forgive our sins. In this letter, Paul made it clear that this was not a private letter. Paul said, all those, all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't say, this guy, this guy, this guy, uh, that guy. He said, all. Paul was saying, although this letter dealt with specific issues facing the church of Corinth, all believers could learn from it. The church of Corinth had a wide diversity of people. Because of wide diversity of people and backgrounds, Paul took great pains to stress both spiritual unity and Christian morality. Grace is God's free gift of salvation given to us in Christ. Believing it brings us peace in a world of noise and confusion and relentless pressures. People long for peace. Look at our world around us. <laughs> Many people give up and they stop searching for peace. They think it's impossible to find any peace and any relief anywhere. True peace of the heart and mind is available to us through our faith in Jesus Christ. Paul in his letter wrote some strong words to the Corinthians. But Paul began on a positive note. Paul affirmed the privilege of being in God's family. He affirmed the power that God gave them to speak out for him and understand his truth. Paul affirmed the reality of their spiritual gifts. When we as followers of Jesus Christ must correct others, it will help if we begin by affirming what God has already accomplished in them. Starting out in a positive note is usually a good idea or a good start. None of us like being talked to in a negative way. We usually do not handle it well. The Corinthian church, just like us, have all the spiritual gifts we need to live the Christian life, to witness for Christ, and to stand against the immorality that surrounds us. Instead of us standing around and doing nothing, we should be listening to what God is asking us to do. We are to reach out to others. We are to live like a Christian life. We are to witness when God gives us a chance. We need to have wisdom to be strong and stand up against the immorality that surrounds us. <coughs> All 
who obey God's word will be considered free from sin when Jesus Christ returns. If you have faith in Christ. Even in those times when your faith is weak, you're still saved. Jesus died on the cross so that we can live. <coughs> Let us pray. Heavenly Father, please forgive our sinfulness. Help us to understand that salvation is by faith alone. Help us to understand that the one who is righteous will live by faith. Help us to see clearly to be forgiven for our sins. We must believe and confess that Jesus is Lord. Salvation comes through Jesus Christ. Thank you for remaining faithful. With faith, we can be absolutely sure that you will keep your promises. Thank you for Jesus Christ who paid the price so that we can go free. Open our minds and our hearts to become more and more like Jesus Christ through the work of the Holy Spirit. We ask that you give us the wisdom and the courage to share Jesus Christ with others. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.